my name's Justine Bailey, as, as uh, Robin mentioned. I'm with our School of Civil Engineering and Surveying. My background is actually as a civil engineer, and I graduated from USQ a couple of decades ago now. I've only been full-time with USQ for a couple of years. Um, before that, my background's actually in industry. So I was involved in working um, for the public sector, managing our, our water resources and, and being involved in some catchment planning, uh, operating some of our dams in Queensland and also providing some consulting services to irrigators. So I've got a fairly broad experience in, in the water industry and that's one of the things that I bring to USQ. One of the questions I get asked a lot uh, as, as a water engineer then is, should we be building more dams? And th there's no question that we have some challenges on our planet in terms of water supply. A very large proportion of the population is in a situation of water scarcity and it's a problem that's increasing. Uh, so the easy, que the easy question is, should we build more dams? It's an easy question but there's no easy answer to it because it's really a complex problem and it's a, a complex answer that, that really comes into play. We're going to take that complexity and try and bring it down into maybe what some of the issues are in about the space of about five minutes. So today, I'm not going to give you the answer, but I'm going to give you a lot to think about. And I'm going to give you a bit to think about in terms of if this is something you'd like to be a part of, maybe being an engineer is, is a future role for you. So water scarcity, what is it? I mean, in, in the simplest form, it just simply means that you don't have enough water for what you need to do in life. At, it, at its most basic level, it means you don't have enough water to drink, to cook, for basic hygiene. And we have large parts of the world uh, that are in that situation and the proportion of our population in that situation is increasing. But it's much more complex than that because sometimes there, there is the water there but it's not of a quality that's suitable to use. And particularly we see uh, in, in some of the more disadvantaged parts of the world where they have enough water but they can't use it because of the, the potential health risk if they do. The other issue is sometimes it's not actually because there's not water there but it's an economic scarcity. So while there might be water, there isn't the funding or infrastructure available in that country or locality to actually get the water to people. So there's a whole range of issues tied up with water scarcity and it's quite challenging. And you'll see on this map from the United Nations that there's not a, a continent on our earth where there aren't water scarcity challenges. It's a, it's a universal issue for us. So could we build some dams to address this problem? And we're going to very, very quickly summarise what the pros of building some dams are and maybe then what the cons of them are. And there's no doubt that there's some significant benefits in building dams. The most obvious one is, is for food supply. It brings water to areas that were previously dry. And if you look at Australia, we're a great example of that. Um, the Murray-Darling Basin, which is, is one of our, our biggest irrigation areas in Australia, um, has converted land that wouldn't have been able to, to sustain the crops it now does and produces an enormous amount of food for our nation and also for other nations. So there's clear benefits in terms of um, dams being able to provide a secure supply and dams are one of the easiest ways to provide a secure supply, so having water when you need it. So a major pro. pro. It's not just also how we use that water for food, there's other advantages of dams and increasingly um, hydropower's back on the agenda right around the world, not just in Australia and certainly in the world. So as we move from a, a coal-based type power economy, dams are one of the options in terms of providing hydro, so it's an alternative energy source. And you'll see that increasingly dams, even built for other reasons, will often have either a very small micro hydro scheme or quite a significant hydro scheme built into them as well. So hydro is one of the big ones. And the other one, we mustn't forget the dams are built for, for all sorts of reasons and flood mitigation is another reason. So Wyvernhoe Dam in southeast Queensland, just near us here in Toowoomba, when it was built, it was built for two purposes. It was built to provide Brisbane with water, but it was also built so that it had some spare capacity to, to capture those stream flows during flood events. And it's quite an effective flood mitigation um, tool. It's not perfect, nothing ever is, but it certainly plays a, a very major role there. So lots of pros when it comes to building dams. There's lots of cons though too. They don't come without their problems. And, and this is pretty much the, the case with any engineered solution to any of our problems on the planet. They do have huge environmental impacts and those environmental impacts are very, very far reaching. So you'll have environmental impacts within the area that's impounded by the dam. 
you've got loss of habitat within that environment. Dam habitats are actually not great for wildlife. It doesn't tend to provide the variety of habitats that they need. And on top of that, you tend to get very, very poor water quality within the dam environment itself. The dams also provide a barrier, and we've had issues with dams for, for a very long time with the impact it's had. It provides barriers to fish movement, which can really significantly impact on fish populations with a river system. But it also provides a really significant barrier to sedimentation. Rivers are really dynamic. They're complex environments. They're designed so that sediment moves up and down and that, that fertilised sediment is what has sustained human populations along riverbanks for thousands of years. Dams are a major barrier to that movement and that, that flow of both nutrients and sediments occurring. The other one is the efficiency of dams, and that word relates to how well they do the job they're intended to do. There was a major study done by the World Commission on Dams in 2000 that did a, a really far-reaching study of dams right throughout the world, and they found there were lots of problems with them. They found that a lot of the time, they didn't achieve the design targets they were meant to achieve. So if they were there for hydro, they weren't generating the amount of energy that was expected. If they were there for irrigation, they weren't providing the security that people expected. So that was one of the issues. Did they meet their design targets? And often it was the case they didn't. Cost overruns are a really big issue too with, with a lot of our water infrastructure right around the world. We tend to underestimate how much it's going to cost to construct and operate something. And the other thing is we tend to overestimate what the economic benefits of that are. We make our projects look really good. So there's a lot of work to be done for engineers and others to be much, much better in this area, to make sure we very clearly identify what the benefits are actually going to be. Because if we're not going to achieve those benefits, we're achieving a whole heap of problems for no reason at all. So the efficiency of our dams is, is something we should be considering. So if we're not going to consider dams or if we're going to reduce the amount of dams we build, what are the alternatives to it? And there's a, a great little um, article called The Three Theories to Save the World. It was an article that was put out by the Australian Academy of Science a little while ago. And it had three basic ideas. And it's something that when we're building dams, we need to think about. Not, in term, not only in terms of what we're doing in terms of doing our job well, but the broader context in which we're operating. The first one is fewer forks. And fewer forks is a, a really controversial one. It's basically the idea of slowing or even reducing population growth. Because at the end of the day, the reason we need this extra infrastructure is because of people. So even if we, we aren't necessarily dealing with the issue of population growth, we need to be aware of it and understanding it so we can predict how to manage for it. Um, the better manners, less is more. This is about the idea of using only what we need to. So just like every other resource, we need to think about do we need as much water as we think we need? And we've got real challenges in the world with changes to um, the world adopting a Western diet. It takes a lot more water to produce a kilogram of beef compared to, say, a kilogram of rice or wheat. And our changing diet and needs is changing how much water, which means we need things like more dams. We're putting more pressure on ourselves to, to find this extra water. The third one um, is in some ways the easiest one as engineers to deal with. And that's the bigger pie, to take what we've got and make sure we're getting more out of what we've got with our water. So that's where the technical innovation comes into play. So it's things like having more efficient systems. And USQ, if you saw in the news in the last week, we had a, a smart automated irrigation team that recently um, won Researcher of the Year in the Cotton Industry Awards this year. So it's the sort of work that USQ does in terms of making sure that if we are if we are going to have irrigation systems, we get as much out of them, which again reduces the pressure on having additional water infrastructure and additional sources. But we also need to think about alternative sources. Uh, desalination is becoming much, much more common, and there's a picture up the, the top there of a desalination plant in Melbourne. And we're going to see more of those alternative sources with all the challenges they face, particularly to do with energy. Uh, the bottom one down, the picture at the bottom where we've got some reclaimed water and plant effluent is relating to reusing our resources, so wastewater. Basically, what flushes from our toilets down to the waste treatment plant is a huge resource. And just as we're having that discussion about how we reuse plastics and all of our other resources, we need to have that discussion about water more and more. And there's plenty of predictions that in Australia, in our east coast cities, 
10 years from now, um, a lot of experts are saying planned reuse, where we actually take that water, we treat it, and we put it straight back into our system to reuse again, is going to become the norm. So that's something we need to be thinking about and having a conversation about. So where to from here? I think most of us want to have a world where we do provide water for crops, for food, for our population. We want to have the waters to sustain our urban environments at the standard we want. But we also need to have environments that are, that are supported. So we need to look at these issues. And engineers are a big part of that. So here at USQ, we've got both an ag, civil and environmental engineering program that all have water resource management components within it. And it's engineers of the future that are going to be the problem solvers to address this. Um, it's these engineers and the next generation coming through that are going to make a difference and, and be our future. Thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, my name is Antoine. I'm a lecturer here at the USQ and you can see here some of the course that I'm teaching at USQ. So I'm involved in uh, chemistry and also in water and wastewater treatment. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, five minutes or so is just give you a brief uh, snapshot of um, the water and wastewater infrastructure that we have here in Toowoomba. So to do that, I'm just going to use a Google map. And I'm sure you've used that before to know where your house is located. So I'm just going to do the same. And first, I'm going to focus on Mount Kynok, a bit north of Toowoomba. And that's where our water treatment plant is located. And if you put the satellite image, uh, that's what you get. So the first thing that you notice is that these plants are actually huge in size. Uh, and they've got funny shapes, circles, rectangles. Um, and yeah, the first thing you can see that they operate 24-7. Uh, that's where we get our uh, clean water from. And if you wonder why your water bill is so expensive, that's the reason why. Because these infrastructure are massive, they're huge. Uh, there is a huge uh, capital cost and maintenance cost uh, to get clean water uh, to drink. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to, to highlight. Um, and if you try to zoom even more, you can see here some cars in the parking lot. You can see there are some rectangles. Um, we've got some sedimentation tank. And if this is something that you are interested in, to learn why we've got these funny shapes, rectangle, what's the purpose of all these units, uh, then the environmental engineering course at USQ is definitely for you. You will learn why we need to have these units, these filters, this sedimentation tank, um, how to design them as well is something that we cover in our course. Um, they have also a laboratory in this building there, so they control and they analyze the water very uh, every day, in fact, to make sure there is no pathogens in the water. There is also a small building there for chlorination. And chlorination is, is very important. It's, it's, uh, what we do to make sure that there are no pathogens in the water. So in the distribution line between this plant and your house, we need to make sure that no pathogens can actually grow in the water. To do that, we need to add a little bit of chlorine. Um, and that's, that's the way we treat water. We, in this plant, they use chemicals to actually treat the water and get clean water uh, out of it. Chlorination is, is really essential. It has been invented probably 100 years ago, and it has saved millions and millions of lives. Uh, it's absolutely essential to chlorinate. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention is that the water going to that plant comes, as you probably know, comes from Kubi Dam, uh, Crestbrook, and Perseverance uh, Dam. Um, going back to chlorination, once you got the water in your house, you actually don't need the chlorine anymore. Uh, as I said, chlorination is essential to make sure there are no pathogens growing in the distribution system. Once it reaches your taps, you actually don't need the chlorine anymore. Sometimes you can actually taste the chlorine in the water that you drink. Uh, chlorine is actually a strong chemical, uh, and it's not 
actually recommended for our bodies is, is quite a strong oxidant. Um, and the reason I'm talking about that is because we should actually boil the water at home before we drink it, because just by boiling, you will actually get rid of that small amount of residual chlorine in the water. So that's quite important because chlorine, as I said, is essential, uh, but once it reaches our home, we don't need it anymore. The second reason why we should boil water at home is because uh, there are some pathogens with, uh, which are resistance, resistant to chlorination. They're actually not bacteria, but they are uh, protozoans. So these are microscopic, uh, very tiny, tiny uh, animals. And we, simply by boiling the water, we can actually kill these, uh, these pathogens. There is a very small risk uh, to have these pathogens in the water, but sometimes they can be there and they are actually resistant to the conventional chlorination. So that's the two reasons why we should boil water. So get rid of the u residual chlorine and reduce even further the, um, the risk of having this pathogen in, in the drinking water. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is just de-zoom de or out-zoom and I'm gonna go a bit south of New England Highway until you see Gombunji Road and then I'm gonna put back the satellite image, and straight away you can see there the wastewater treatment plant in Toowoomba, the uh, Wetala wastewater treatment plant. Again, you can see them from, from space because they are huge in size and they've got these very particular shapes. They've got this brown rectangle also with black circles. So this is very typical for a wastewater treatment plant uh, everywhere in the world you can see this sort of shape when you zoom in a big city. Um, and again, they've got circles, rectangle. If this is something you are interested to know more about, why we've got this rectangle, why is it so huge, uh, why we've got this black sedimentation tank, then you should definitely enroll for uh, our environmental engineering course at USQ, where you will basically learn uh, why we need to have these tanks, how they operate, why uh, are they so large, um, they operate 24-7. Uh, you can see that some have, have actually aeration on. You can see the, uh, the frothing, the, uh, the bubbles in some of the tanks, while some other tanks are completely brown, there is no aeration, and we actually need this different sort of tank to remove nitrogen from our wastewater. Um, so last, last thing, just to conclude, is um, the outcome of the courses that we offer is that basically at the end of the program, you'll be able to design these tank, your, these, these uh, processes and this uh, plant uh, yourself. So you'll have all the uh, mathematical background, chemistry background, and engineering background so that you can actually design the, this plan by yourself. That's one of the outcome of uh, our engineering program here at USQ. So similarly for the water treatment plan, you'll be able to design uh, this plan yourself uh, if you know the influent uh, water composition and the flow rate. And I'd like to now welcome up our panel. Kira, what's it like studying engineering? Um, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> um, so just to give you guys some context, I'm in my fourth year now, so my last semester, and I'm studying environmental engineering. So I graduated from King Roy State High in 2014 and came straight to USQ. Um, I didn't know what I was interested in. I knew I liked biology and I liked chemistry, but I wasn't sure where I wanted to apply it. Um, I suppose probably my favourite part of engineering and why I went into engineering rather than the environmental science side of things was the problem solving aspect. And that's what I really enjoy, is the problem solving side of things. And like I've had courses with both Justine and Antoine and designing their wastewater treatment plants, etc., which is lots of fun. Um, but yeah, that's probably my favorite part of, of 
environmental engineering at USQ and also where it's taken me as well thus far. So I've been able to study abroad. I went to Germany for a month um, and got to look at the different sorts of wastewater treatment plants they've got going there, hydropower, um, got to go to wind farms, bioenergy plants, everything, and just look, look at the way Europe's doing things because it's on a whole another level to Australia, which was excellent. But yeah. There are so many different pathways um, to make entry into engineering. Um, what I would recommend you do is um, take 10 minutes this morning um, and go see our How to Apply team. Um, so what we can do is show you the different pathways, our different options, um, our associate degree that moves into our engineering degrees and then obviously moving on when you're more in your fourth year to look at a postgraduate degree in engineering as well. Um, we also, also are available all the time um, during the week to have a chat so you can call our team um, and we can walk you through all the options and send you through either an email or mail you out some um, hard copy documents if that suits you better. Um, but definitely come and chat with us so we can show you the very best pathway.